the introduction. That, that sounds very strange. I mean, I, I can't believe that, that that's about me. <laughs> yeah. uh, and quite longer than I expected. And, uh, I mean, it was great. I mean, it was kind of a moment for me to sort of reflect my life and you know, what <laughs> I have done so far. <laughs> That's nice. Okay, so uh, as introduced, my name is uh, Unsun Yeo. By the way, uh, I, I'm going to talk about this again, but Y-E-O is my family name. And we, we'll get back to that topic later because, I mean, there, there's something serious with... Okay, I, I'll talk about it later. Sorry. <laughs> Today is March 16, <laughs> 2015, and it is Monday, and I said it is Monday, and yeah, it is Monday, and the problem is, you know, I hate Mondays, and <laughs> you know, this semester, I mean, as far as I remember, I, I've always had classes on Monday, and you know, if you have a class on Monday, you are usually haunted during the weekend, you know, with some nightmare of your Monday class. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay, thank you, great. Yeah. Active participation. Okay, anyway, so this semester is actually the first semester with no Monday class for me, so I was really happy. But then, HCAP team. <laughs> emailed me to come to give a lecture at 10 a.m. Monday for two hours, so <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> so, I mean, you will see many technical difficulties or some glitches or, you know, bad organized, badly organized slides or many, I mean, many horrible things from now on, but just blame not me, but the fact that this is Monday, so. And as a revenge, I brought three <laughs> quizzes for you guys. And, you know, <laughs> I'm a professor and this is, you know, something I can do very good, so. Okay. All right, so with some noise, I'd like to play three songs and your job is to guess who the composers are for the three songs. Uh, okay, so let me first start. <laughs> oh, sorry, let me play it again. Oh. <laughs> again, Monday sucks. <laughs> Stop here. Any guess? Great. Yeah. Yay. Yay. Awesome. Wow. Fantastic. So, yeah, you guys love music. Okay, great. Next song. It might be a little bit harder. You got it just after listening to three notes of the piece? Wow. Did that? Oh, wow. Oh, okay. Uh, that's amazing. Thank you. All right. So one thing I can promise is we're going to go back to these songs and see who the real composers are. The problem is with this one. So this is my first name, actually, Unsun. Like many Koreans, I have two Korean letters for my first name and one letter for my last name. And the thing is, for most Americans or for most non-native Korean speakers, 
this one is very hard to pronounce. And, you know, believe it or not, even my parents cannot pronounce that part correctly. You know, if you're from certain part of Korea, you may have trouble pronouncing the U. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 right, right, right. So, so, you know, since even my parents cannot pronounce it correctly, I cannot ask you guys to pronounce my name correctly. So, you know, on walk around would be just to call me Wuni, and that is the name I used when I lived in the States for about seven, eight years. And I majored in computer music, the problem is it is quite hard to define what computer music is. I mean, everyone has different definition of computer music, I think. And this is a typical situation. So uh, I think I'm doing almost every one of these things. So I'm not sure which one you, you know, like the best. Okay, anyway. To be more specific, I would say my research topic is something like computer-based music theory and acoustics. So usually I you know, work on some computer programs for musicians or some hardware stuff for musicians for performance on stage or you know, things like that. Okay. <coughs> and some of the, the activities I have done so far include this kind of multimedia dance performance and I sometimes make music using mobile phones which sounds quite crazy and is crazy and I've also done some audiovisual exhibitions at galleries like this and but mostly what I'm doing is something like that very you know, nerdy you know, boring engineering stuff Sometimes fun, of course. All right, so today's topic is again music and technology. And what I'd like to talk about is to see how science and technology change music, or how science and technology change the way we make or enjoy music. And let me just start with some, you know, trivia quizzes. So this picture is an old drawing from ancient China and that actually depicts the process of making paper, making some papers. And just in case, does anyone know when the very first paper was made? I mean, in, in the history? I, I mean, you know. From Egypt? There might be too, way, way too, yeah, way, way too long ago, I think. But, but I mean, for, for, for the real paper, I mean, for, for the papers like we use these days, it, the, the record says it was first made in you know, AD 105 in China. And then, again, this picture is actually the very first picture, photo actually, sorry, the very first photo in the history of mankind, which was taken in, any guess, in the year of 1700, or 1800, or 1900? Yeah, 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 pretty much, right, right. So it was in 1826. The thing is, I mean, the, the, there was, actually something earlier than that. So 10 years before this, there's a record that someone took a photo. The problem was it didn't last long. It lasted just for a couple of days because of the, the insufficient technology for you know, printing, I think. Anyway, <coughs> sorry about that. And now we have these two photos of two gentlemen, and these are taken in the mid-1800s, I think. And any, any guess? B, 
behind these two photos? I mean, can you imagine what's going on in this case? I know it sounds weird, but let me first tell you that the, the photo at the bottom right, that was taken by Niebs, a Dutch you know, researcher, and that, to, for, for Niebs to take that photo, it took actually eight hours. It took quite long because they didn't have the technology to you know, control the shutter fast. So it's just like the camera obscure. I mean, you, you, the, the pinhole camera. So it took a long time. And in the mid 1800s, the situation wasn't that much different. So for these guys to you know, have their pictures taken, they had to stand in that pose for quite a long time. So in fact, they actually used things like this. They had to use some stands to lean on and stand still. And these are called as Brady stands. And they were actually patented and sold in about two, 200 years ago. Sorry. And now we have a much better photo of a gentleman. And here I have two questions. So the first one is, who, can you guess who this gentleman is? Hint might be the object on the table. No, you're not interested. You, you, you hate technology or history or... Yeah. Morse. Sorry? Morse. Morse? Yeah, it's, it's pretty much in the same era, I think. Actually, it is Thomas Edison. And the photo was taken in 1878. So, yeah, much better quality. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, much better quality. I mean, the thing is, it's not the photo that matters here. It is actually the object on table that I'd like to be interested in. And that is actually the very first device Edison used to record sound. And that is the very beginning point of our you know, discussion on music technology. And Edison called it as phonograph. And it looked, it looked kind of like this. So it, sound, it looks very <coughs> weird, but in fact, there is a cylinder made of tin foil or lead or wax. And the thing is, you record the sound by actually making some grooves. I mean, cutting the surface of the cylinder to record the sound as a pattern, as a groove. And this is the cylinder that Edison used for sound recording. And about, oh, sorry. So, I forgot that I have to use this. So this is actually the very first sound that Edison recorded. It is noisy anyway, so. Yeah, I think I can stop here. Not, not that interesting. Anyway, uh, 10 years later, we had something like this. So now people didn't use the cylinder anymore. They started to use some circular disc, flat disc, to record sound. And this one was called as gramophone. And I'm pretty sure you have seen this name you know, at many different places, like the, the record label name, Deutsche Grammophon, and you know, things like that. And so those, I mean, these two were the most popular method for recording sound and actually selling music to customers. And 
here's one interesting thing. Quality-wise, Edison cylinder was much better. I mean, it had much better sound, but the thing is, it was gone. Now, we have only this circular disk. There's no cylinder. The biggest reason behind that is for cylinders, they took so much space. I mean, if you want to store maybe hundreds or you know, thousands of songs, it took too much space. But compared to the cylinders, disks didn't take up much space. So finally, and, and it was easier to use. But that's just more behind the story, anyway. <coughs> yep. And this is kind of the zoom in picture of the groove that you can find out on disks. And this is kind of the device that people used for recording sound in 1920s. So you put a disk on, okay. Now I can use this. So you can put a disk on this, you know, turntable, literally, and then, you know, cut the disk to make a record. And here's a video, again, I need to plug this in. Here's a video of, of you know, the, I, I think this is from 1940s and from the 1940s and it was taken at uh, RCA Victor factory. So it shows how people make records. And if you look at the video, it is more like a chemical process or it kind of feels like you're in a kitchen. You know, making some pizza or so I'm showing this video in order to show you how people recorded sound about 70 years ago so you first make that you know plastic disc made of wax and then just like in in the kitchen you bring it to the next room the only difference is that is the recording room so the engineer put the stylus on the wax. And believe it or not, this gentleman is the audio engineer. So you can imagine a musician in front of the mixing, very big and large mixing console. And that is what he's doing right now exactly the same thing. So he's ready to take the sound from the studio, the recording booth, and he now gives a signal to the musicians inside, like that, and they start to record. This is actually a very sensitive process because once we make mistake, any mistake, you know, there's no turning back. You have to do it again. So you have to bring a new wax disc and then you start the recording from the very beginning again. So there's no editing or whatsoever. So it's just, you know, one, one, one time process. Anyway, that, that is how people made record in, about 70 years ago. And the video actually lasts much longer, but I think we'd better stop here for now. And I'm pretty sure many of you know this composer slash pianist. And whoa, I need to plug it again. And you, you have heard of this, you know, piano piece before, I'm pretty sure. 
But if you check such pieces, they aren't that long. Actually, they are shorter than about three minutes, almost every one of them. It is actually because in the old days, I mean, at that time, the longest length for a record is about 3 minutes and 30 seconds. So you cannot write your songs longer than that. If you want to put your song on one record or one side of record and sell it, the song should be shorter than 3 minutes and 30 seconds. Usually 3 minutes. So that is part of the reason why all the popular music isn't that long. I mean, if you think about the classical music, you know, in the old days, in 17th century or 18th century, or even 19th century, they are quite longer. Sometimes they last 10 minutes or 20 minutes, but all the popular songs we listen to these days, they don't, you know, get much longer. So, another thing is, because of the limitations in duration, if you want to take many songs with you, or if you want to record a long piece, you had to bring many records together at the same time. So just like the photo album we use these days, actually not these days, we used about maybe 10 years ago or something, you know, they had some kind of booklet, booklet or book for storing multiple records. That's why they have, they use the term album for, you know, this. And I think the important point here is this. So the fact that people could record sound means people got some freedom. By freedom, I mean there's now low, no limitations to music listening in, time, in terms of time and space. Before the era of sound recording, if you want to listen to music, you had to be there where musicians perform, actually. You have to be at the very place, at the very time where musicians perform, right? After we could record sound, we don't have to do that anymore. We just listen to the music we want to listen, wherever we want and whenever, whenever we want. So here's the thing. Technology makes us, I mean, it gives us more choices and makes us free. In other sense, technology kind of allows us to overcome the barrier or the limitations. And another important portion of that you know, liberation, maybe, would be broadcasting. Through broadcasting technology, you don't have to be at the venue or at the same spot. You can remotely watch or listen to the music or concert and portable devices. This is another big thing. You know, with portable devices, we got the true freedom in terms of you know, location and time. And the, the one above is the very first transistor radio from Sony, the portable one. It was you know, manufactured in 1950s. And the one below here is the, the ancestor of the iPod or, you know, the smart phones we have. Not, not the smartphones, but the, the iPod. And that is about 40 years old, I think, now. Okay. And another big thing is the digital technology. So I don't want to go into the details of digital technology or the difference between analog and digital, but one important fact is in order to store information or you know, manipulate information using computers, it should be in a digital format, right? So we need to convert analog information into digital, and this is a very you know, rough 
drawing of that process. But anyway, the, the one here, the one at the bottom, this is the digital you know, format of the information. And once we have the sound this way, we can store the sound and manipulate the sound and transmit the sound quite freely without any loss of quality. And here's a very interesting animation, which was quite popular, I think, about three to four months ago on, on Facebook. And that is called the evolution of the desk. So it starts, I mean, it, it shows the, how a typical desk, the look of a typical desk changes over time from early 1980s to you know, 2014. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, at the very beginning, we have a lot of things on table. But as time goes, things start to disappear. By disappearing, I mean you know, it starts to be you know, moved onto the computer as a software or you know, represented as an icon like that. So, through digital technology, things around us are being virtualized. I mean, it used to be physical, but not physical anymore. We don't have information as something we can hold or grab or see in front of our eyes. Everything is now invisible, and we cannot hold them. And a very short animation, but that kind of shows the trend, the ma main trend of change in terms of you know, virtualization or digital information. And when it comes to music media, we can order them in, you know, in, in terms of history or maybe the time people used. So, let me just ask one thing. How many of you have actually used this, the, the LP? Okay, not, not, not many of you. And how about this? All right, a little bit more. And I bet. And maybe, I, I, don't, I don't need to ask in this case. Okay, so pretty much everyone. Okay, so this thing, called LP. I mean, this is called LP because the, the old record, the, we have seen the video, video of you know, the record making video, and that record was called as SP short play because it didn't last that long. The duration was less than three minutes and 30 seconds. In this case, this one can take 24 minutes of sound on one side. So that's why it got the name LP and cassette and compact disc and digital music player. And here, in the age of LP, which practically started from early 1960s to 1980s, early 1980s, in the age of this LP, in fact, album artwork was a big issue. You know, when you get a new release of an album from an artist, people always <coughs> wondered what kind of artwork it would you know, take. So we have these kind of masterpieces. Now, not only this, but there are so many you know, masterpieces in terms of artwork. But if you think about the music these days, we don't actually care. I mean, you, you don't really remember what kind of image or what kind of photo your favorite music actually has, right? So we, we're not interested in this anymore. And the thing is, because in, in, this, at, in, in this age, the record was quite big. So, you know, it was very easy to see, but not anymore. Now we can see the image on this very small screen. So, P 
people don't actually pay much attention. And here's a very big division between these guys and these guys. And that is analog versus digital. So until this LP and cassette tape, it was analog. And from compact disc, it is digital. So we all know that. I think, however, the bigger difference or bigger <coughs> excuse me, division should be made here between the compact disc and the iPod or portable music player. And the reason is, I mean, this is actually quite serious thing. Until this music was something you can actually hold and grab. And if you want to listen to music, something must be revolving or rotating. I mean, if you want to listen to a music, listen to some music on LP, you have to put the LP on a turntable, right? So the disc should revolve. And the process of buying music means you go to a record store and get a record bring it to your home and you listen to it. Same thing here and the same thing here, but not anymore. From the age of iPod, I mean from the year of 2000, music is not a thing you can actually grab. You can have them as computer files on your portable devices, but not like something you can hold anymore. So that actually means quite a lot. And similar things happen in many different areas in our lives, I think. And here's another interesting, maybe not interesting, but you know, to, at least to me, it is quite interesting. Sorry about that. And the RIA, Recording Industry Association of America, has this information. And it actually, the, the graph actually shows the average duration of pop music over about seven decades. So it starts from 1940s to 50s, 60s, and up to, you know, quite recent time, 2010. And as we can see, in the old days, until 1960s, the average duration of the song doesn't go over don't go longer than 3 minutes and 30 seconds because we all know by now that at that time the maximum duration for a record wasn't longer than that, it was about 3 minutes and 30 seconds. However, we actually have this LP from 1960s. It was first you know, developed, I mean made in 1949 or 1950 but it actually hit the market and became the major you know, medium around this time, 1960s. And CD came in around 1980, early 1980s, and we have had the iPod in the very beginning of this you know, new century. And as we can see, with the introduction of LP, the average duration of the song increases quite rapidly, about by one minute, because from this point, there, there was no limitation, right? So people didn't have to think about the, the limit of three minutes and 30 seconds. And then, you know, CD didn't change that much. So the, the average duration of pop music was about there, four minutes and 30 seconds or something. But after that, after the introduction of the iPod, it now started to increase again. Because from here, there's virtually no limitation in terms of the length of the music you can store on your portable device. Right? And another interesting thing is, okay, as I said, we have seen the introduction of the LP in 1960 and the CD in 1980 and the iPod in 2000. And, you know, so we can see that every 20 years, 
there's some major change. Started from LP to CD and the portable digital music player. So naturally the question here is what would be the next? What would be the next major player in terms of you know, music medium? And many people say it would be the streaming service. So <coughs> with, even with iPod, you can actually own your music on your own device. But from the next generation of on-demand streaming service, it won't be anything like that. There's no possession, just like the, the lyrics of you know, John Lennon's song, Imagine. There's no possession, maybe. <laughs> Sorry about that. Bad analogy, but anyway. So, I mean, in a sense, you have everything, every music in the world on your device, but in some other sense, you have nothing. So it's quite interesting. It's becoming interesting. And, you know, we already have these many services around us that stream music online. And they are doing it quite good. They actually analyze your preference and see what type of music you're interested in, you know, which artist you love. And based on that information, they recommend music for you. And some of these guys, like Pandora or maybe you know, some other you know, services, they are doing a really great job, I think. Okay. And another research uh, from the world's third greatest university, after Ihua and Harvard, of course. <laughs> yeah. You know, inside me there's a little bit different voice, but let's put it that way for now, okay. And yeah, so uh, there's a very interesting research here. <coughs> It was about five years ago, and a music professor at Stanford, Jonathan Berger, who happened to be my old advisor, and he found that many young students, I mean, you know, okay, by principle or not by principle, in, in general, if you're supposed to compare the quality of sound of a music from a CD player and from an iPod compressed, then theoretically you will choose the music from the CD player as the one with better sound. But the thing is, he have conducted this research for about seven years from mid-2000. I think it was 2004 or something, three or four. And he concluded that younger people who started to listen to the iPod from the very beginning they actually prefer the low quality sound of iPod over the higher quality sound of CD or LP. So the title was Good Enough is a New Great, or I would say, I mean, it is not about the technology or the, the physical measurement or the, the absolute quality or anything like that, but it is more about familiarity or, you know, how your experience, I would say. So, this is another example that technology is affecting the way we enjoy music or the way we listen to music. Okay. And, okay, one more quiz. It's getting very... Sorry, you, you didn't expect to have these kind of things, right? Just like I didn't expect to have Monday lecture, right? So <laughs> now it makes me feel better. Okay, sorry about that. So, okay, so here's your job, which is to see what's the difference between these two scores. Of course, they are different music, and they are in different keys, and they have different measure, so bit, bit and but if you look at those these scores a little bit closely, you may find that, you know, on this one on the right, we can find some letters that we cannot find here. And we also can find some, you know, mathematics symbols like inequality sign. No, sorry, crescendo and decrescendo. And these guys 
for instructing you to hold patterns for one measure, right? And you cannot find anything like this on this side. Is it because the composer of this song is more trained or more advanced or more sophisticated? Maybe, but not necessarily. It turns out that the composer of this song is, you know, Bach, and this one is Chopin. So, you know, we're going to talk about the, these gentlemen one, one more time, I think. So, we cannot say that this guy should learn music more in order to, you know, compose something like this. The secret behind this is Bach actually used this instrument while Chopin used something like this for his composition and performance. So this one is called harpsichord, kind of the ancestor of the piano. And this is what, the, the, what, what we use. So Chopin used an instrument which is pretty much the same one we use these days, but this is quite different. In case of the piano, I mean, you can control the dynamics. I mean, if you press the key softly, the sound will be soft. But if you press the key hard, it will become louder. Not in this case. With the harpsichord, there's no control for you to, I mean, in terms of dynamics. However hard you press the key, the loudness of the sound is the same, as long as it goes above a certain threshold. And the, the mechanical structure of sound making is also quite different. In case of this piano, you can control, I mean, you, you make the sound by actually, you know, hitting the string using a hammer inside. Here, it's more like plucking, plucking a guitar string. So the mechanism is actually quite different. And over the history, people try to use different sources for you know, musical instrument. So this is the, the original and the old you know, case of making sound. You plug or hit the strings and the vibration of the strings are transmitted to the body and then amplified naturally, kind of. Here we use electricity to amplify the sound, and in this case we go one step further to generate sound or modify or you know, manipulate the sound using the help of computers. And there are real instruments, but at the same time we have many different types of digital devices and using those devices, we have now virtual instrument, which you can use to play sound using your computer or your tablet or whatever. We all know this. And again, there are some crazy people doing very interesting things. And this one is called as reactable. And actually, some people call this as react table because it is a tabletop interface. So, you know. Let me play the video. So, yeah, so you have this table, and on the table you put some object, and <coughs> as you put the object, you have some virtual control around the object, and depending on the location or the rotation, I mean the, the degree or the angle you make with those objects, you can actually control some you know, parameters, some properties of the music. So it's like you're doing these things on table to, you know, have some DJing fun kind of thing. some more Michael Jackson or you know, <laughs> maybe not, not this time. Anyway, now I'm talking about how technology changes the 
the area of musical instrument, and this is the first thing. So we now use tabletop interfaces for music performance. Another example would be this one, iPhone Ocarina. I, I'm pretty sure many of you have used or, or at least have seen the video of this one, but I guess this is one of the smartest you know, example. <coughs> so, by the way, you, you all know what ocarina is, the, the you know, very small Japanese instrument. I mean, you know. so in this case, he's emulating the ocarina using the smartphone. So actually, on your phone, you have the microphone, right? So you blow the air into the microphone, and you use the touch screen as the tone hole. So depending on the pattern of your, you know, fingers, you can control the pitch of the sound you're making. And what's more, you know, fascinating is you actually have the score on screen. So you can see the screen and then, you know, find out the, the pattern that you need to make for the next note. It is quite cool except the fact that you have to make your eyes this way so it may not look that good for others, you know. Anyway, a very interesting use of, you know, something we didn't really expect to use for music. So this is another, you know, trend. There are so many gadgets and technologies we have right now and many people try to use them as a tool or a new source for making musical instruments. And, okay, another example from the world's third greatest university is uh, this one. So they actually have something called Stanford Laptop Orchestra. And as you can see, this is the floor of a concert hall. And now you see these performers, they are on stage without any traditional instrument. Instead, they have a laptop. I mean, each one of these players have a laptop in front of him or her and another external controller. So by moving the controller, they actually control, send some signal to the computer. And it is the computer, the laptop, that creates the sound. So there's no traditional instrument but laptops on stage. So they call it as Stanford Laptop Orchestra. Okay, so the music is quite cool. Of course, it depends on your definition of music. But anyway. <coughs> okay, and this is another crazy attempt to you know, use smartphone for music. And unfortunately, this is done by me. <laughs> and yeah, so if on stage, there's one performer or one person who holds a smartphone and moving it like this. And as you can see on the screen behind, we, it, it is kind of visualized, the direction is aiming at is visualized as an arrow or a triangle. So at this stage, nothing really happens. He's just doing this, you know, meaningless waving thing. Uh, but something begins to happen as the second performer comes up onto the stage, which is me, by the way. <laughs> and he turns on the phone, and now there's some interaction going on. So as the first performer aims at the second performer, we can listen to a note, right? And vice versa. So I can also make some sound by aiming at the other performer. Since we have two performers, there's only two notes we can make, which is quite boring. So we decided to have one more. And now we have more combinations. And if you're good at math, you can actually calculate. I mean, you know, 
the, the combination or permutation, permutation I think in this case. Sorry, I mean, and maybe three is not enough, so I have one more. Now we have four performers, and the combination is becoming quite complex. So you, you can think of how many different, you know, couples or connections you can make using, you know, four performers on stage. So the difference between this and traditional performance or traditional musical instrument is that, you know, in the usual cases, you make music with your own instrument. You control the pitch and loudness and timbre of the sound of your instrument by yourself. In this case, in order to perform music or in order to create sound or control pitch, you have to interact with others. I mean, you have to aim at someone else and you don't really control the action of the other peers on stage. Right? So we try to see how, I mean, what kind of different ways we can you know, suggest in terms of making music. And this is a very short video of the, the application. our team developed about four years ago, I think. And this is to kind of visualize the musical preference, the, the similarity of musical preference of two you know, smartphone users. So it's like making virtual connection between two phones and see who they have you know, common in the playlist. So kind of the, the easy way to get familiar with your friends or, you know, your, uh, I don't know, your enemy or whatever. Uh, you know, it, it depends on your, you know, social situation, I would say. Okay, and another, yet another crazy thing, which is to have a network connection. And, okay, so before we begin, I mean, the music really is frightening, so let me just stop it here and <laughs> Oh, it is, it is, trust me. I mean, so, yeah, we have four screens behind, and on stage we have six performers, and this was actually in Seoul. So, this, uh, these are our local players, and we have four screens. On here we have Sarah Weaver from New York, UN headquarters actually, and this is from, if I remember correctly, Banff, Canada, Belfast, Northern Ireland, and this is from San Diego. So here's the thing, you know, in terms of music appreciation or music listening, now there's no barrier. I mean, there's no limitation in terms of time and space. When it comes to music making or music performance, however, it's a different story. We still have the barrier or limitations in terms of time and space. If you want to jam with your friends, if you want to have some fun, I mean, if you want to make music, you have to be at the same place, at the same time with your fellow performers, right? This is an attempt to overcome that barrier and we try to connect performers in five different cities to see how we can perform together at the same time over network. So we used some special network connection which was quite fast it was blazingly fast and try to perform together and the music sounds just like this so I warned you, you know. I mean it's a great it's a really great piece I, I, I love the piece but for, for some of you may, maybe Quiz, 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 sorry about that. Maybe time to unplug this for now. From, and yeah, so now it is about visual art. We have a painting and could you guess who the painter is? Guess or maybe, no. It is actually, <coughs> excuse me, the, the painting by Mondrian and 
the, the name of the piece, the, the picture is composition with lines. And here's another painting. And now my question is, can you guess the, the painter? Sorry? Yeah, I, I, I wish, but I, I, I'm, <laughs> I don't have that much free time, so, you, you know. No, no, so, sorry. Uh, I, I asked this question, this, this question, you know, quite many times, but, yeah, many, many times I, I get that answer. Is it you who, who you know, drew that, yeah. you know? Let me just say that I'm not that smart. You know. And this is actually done by an American researcher, Michael Knorr, in 1966. And this is actually one of the most pioneering you know, epic work in terms of computer-generated artwork. So what Mr. Knorr did was to kind of write a program which generates a picture that looks quite similar to that of this Mondrian drawing. And he did some tests. He showed both of these pictures to people and asked them which is better, which is better. And also, you know, <coughs> could, could they, I mean, could people tell the difference between these two? And he wrote a paper and published it on a Journal of Psychological Record in 1966, which was 50 years ago. And this was amazing because, I mean, it actually provoked a lot of questions and debate and argument between people. And the, the biggest one, I think, was, is it art? I mean, if you have a picture or if you have some visual information which was drawn by a computer, can we call it an art? In that case, the definition of art would be something like human creation, right? So that was the first thing. And the second question might be something like, if we consider this as art, then the act of programming he did would be an artistic performance? Kind of questions. So there could be many different questions on the essence or the, the concept of what he did. And now this talk is going into pretty much the same issue in the music area. So it's time for us to talk about computer-generated music. By generated music, I mean not the case of sound synthesized by computer, but the case of actually having computer as the composer of the piece. And we call that process of algorithmic composition. So, you know, by, by, by default or by definition, composition is algorithmic. There are some rules to follow, even with you know, the pieces from human composers, there are some rules to follow in order to you know, create music. And in, in usual cases, in, especially in the you know, classic Western music, some people say the music of dead white guys. And we have some rules. I mean, you know, first we need some rules for arranging the musical note in the horizontal direction. We start from one note, and then the next note could be you know, many different notes. But there are some rules in terms of progression over time. And also, there could be another rule for stacking up the note. So what kind of note, or, or which note, would sound at the same time? Usually, we call this, the, the rule for vertical direction, as harmony, and the one for this direction as counterpoint. So harmony and counterpoint are the two basic you know, 
stuff for traditional musical composition. And I think it might be way too much, but this is the time we may think of something like AI, artificial intelligence. So this is where we want to see how far computers can go in terms of you know, mimicking human behavior or literally you know, human intelligence. And this is kind of the, the definition of artificial intelligence, which you can find on Wikipedia or you know, these you know, references. So, I mean, these days we, we are quite familiar with the concept of AI, but let me just read these sentences for, I mean, to, to kind of highlight some important concept. The intelligence exhibited by machines or software. So we can see that it is about intelligence. Here's actually one important question. What is intelligence then? So we're going to talk about that in a minute. And also it is exhibited by machines or software. So it is not by human. It is by computer in most cases. And the study and design of intelligent agent in which an intelligent agent is a system that perceives its environment and takes actions that maximizes its chances of success. So that would be the kind of the former definition of AI. And believe it or not, AI is all around us. Of course, there could be you know, different AIs at different levels, but one of the most famous examples would be the Deep Blue, the, the chess computer, which has you know, beaten the human champion Kasparov quite a long time ago. And we use you know, email services, which in most cases you know, run spam filters for every day. This is also based on you know, some kind of computer program which we consider as AI. And character recognition, facial recognition, voice recognition, and Siri might be the, one of the famous examples. And chatbot, and we, we'll get back to this issue again. And speaking of AI, there's an interesting concept named Turing test, which is, of course, after the, the, the genius mathematician Alan Turing. And actually, Turing himself you know, suggested this concept. I mean, this is to test whether a AI, an AI, artificial intelligence, is perfect or not. And the way to test it is, suppose that you are here, you are the investigator or interrogator or whatever. You're, you're the user of the system. And you s interact with the system. So it's like you're, you're chatting with someone who you don't know over the computer and see whether it is computer or human. So if you can find something weird or something strange, and if you suspect that it is not a human, then the system fails to pass the Turing test. But if you think your peer is a human being, then the system passes the test. That is the concept of Turing test. So when it comes to music composition, now the job is to create a program which makes some music that makes us think it is written by a human composer. And that was exactly what I did. I played three songs, and all of those songs were composed by computers, actually. So I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But before then, we, we can see the, the actual Turing test in life. You know, I don't think we can actually call it as a Turing test, but, but it's Alan, so I, I think you know, it's definitely worth watching. Oh, sorry about that. Not too easy. You've got a meeting at 4.30. How's the traffic going home? You're connected at 
Hey, I just realized we found my Ellen. Uh, yeah, I'm Ellen. That's so cool. Can you get me tickets to 12 days? Text Portia. Are you sure you want to text Portia? What? Wouldn't you rather be dancing? No, text Portia. Come on, Ellen, dance for me. Pretty please, and tickets to 12 days. Where's my 430 meeting? Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. I love when you say that. Siri, I need to know where my meeting is. Sorry, checking. I found it. It's on the corner of Beggar Groupon Street and Bogey Down Boulevard. Please dance, Ellen. I'm not dancing. In this case, <laughs> sorry, in this case, can you say it passed the Turing test? I, I, I don't know. But anyway, I mean, of course, the real theory won't do that, <laughs> right? You know. And here's a, something more serious or something really, I mean, <laughs> this is actually the, one of the most hilarious videos I have ever seen, at least you know, w within the last year. Uh, now it's like you're having two bots chatting with each other. So, so it's like Siri versus Siri, and they use chatbot or, or you know, the, uh, it, it's a work from the Cornell Creative Machines Lab, and it's quite interesting. Clever bot, I think. Hello there. Hi, how are you? Great, you. I'm okay. That's good. Are you good? <laughs> yes, I am good. I just said I was. No, you didn't. I said I was. <laughs> so you are a robot? No, my name is Cleverbell. Yes, you are a robot and you were named as Cleverbell. I am a robot. <laughs> yes, I know. You can get a way robots. I'm not a robot. I'm oh, sorry, sorry. Now, now it's becoming very serious. So, sorry, I, I. I just said yeah. I was. No, you didn't. I said I was. So you are a robot. No, my name is Cleverbell. Yes, you are a robot, and you were named as Cleverbell. I am a robot. Yes, I know. You can get a robot. I'm not a robot. I'm a unicorn. Yeah, this is getting weird from. Here. You said earlier that you were a robot. I did not. I thought you did. You were mistaken. Which is odd. Since you were mistaken, you were talking about it. I've answered all your questions. <laughs> no, you haven't. What is God in you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. From this point, it, it's becoming frightening, actually. Okay. Not everything could also be something. For example, not everything could be half of something, which is still something, and therefore not nothing. <laughs> Very true. I would like to imagine it is. Do you believe in God? <laughs> yes, I do. So you're Christian? No, I am not. How you say you were not helpful, therefore you are a medium? How you say it ought to be? That does not make sense. So do you want to have a body? Sure. Or in what? <laughs> okay, so, yeah. Of course, we don't want this happen in, in music composition, but anyway, you know, what's really frustrating is, you know, you know, we can actually see people like that in the real world, right? It, it isn't much different from the, you know, some, some conversations I have heard, you know, at the faculty meeting. Oh, Isha, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so AI for music, do we want something like that? Maybe, maybe too much at this point, we just want something, you know, some music from the computer. So now back to the question again, can computers compose music? And for this, we may run some musical Turing test. And now back to the first questions again the pieces. So believe it or not, these are the pieces composed or generated by a computer who, by the way, the, the machine actually learned the stars of Bach. So for this to happen, the programmer 
actually feed, fed information, I mean fed the scores of Bach, and tried the computer to analyze the pieces and find some characteristics of Bach and see what kind of decisions you know, it can make. So if we have one note here, the computer would try to see how Bach proceeded from that note. If, if Bach had this end, then maybe computer can calculate the probability of each of the notes that will come next. So something like that. So again, this one is actually quite weird. It started like the, the Moonlight Sonata a little bit. So at that point, may, some of you may have realized it's Beethoven, and yeah, it is actually quite similar. And if, if you you know go through the whole piece of this, it's very similar to Moonlight Sonata, but a little bit different. So if some of you may present this as your assignment for your composition class, you will be you know blamed for maybe you know, plagiarism or uh, I, I don't know illegal copy should I say and, and Chopin and this is so amazing I mean you know just one or two phrases in the very beginning gives you the impression of Chopin and there are actually I think more than one songs which is quite similar to this so you know my, my first reaction to this piece was just like, oh, I know this piece, it's Chopin. And yeah, so it's quite amazing. But uh, anyway, so the, these songs were written by a software which, written, which was written by Dr. David Cope, who was a professor at UC Santa Cruz. And he had a very interesting project called EMI, Experiment in musical intelligence and he did a lot of interesting things like he composed an opera of his own of course but in Mahler style so you know he, he did many crazy and interesting things and now the question is did it pass the Turing test and I think it is kind of yes at, at least in, in you know this room it passed the Turing test and some people still you know, complain that the, the stars are too much like the original composer, so it is more like you know, plagiarism, not you know, composition. And here's another example of the latest you know, algorithmic composition thing, which is, oh, sorry, which is generated by a computer called Iamus, and here, in this case, the difference between this one and the previous one of David Cox is that in this case there's no human intervention at all. So the programmer wrote the program and then that's it. The rest is totally up to the computer. So the computer created everything without any human intervention. So this is a video that kind of you know shows the process hablo español okay then then yeah, no problem for you but for for the rest of us yeah yeah so i mean you can go to youtube and actually they now have a very nice you know the the caption service for for you know. that is also generated by ai by the way anyway uh the, what, what they are commenting here is the fact that it is created by a computer program which runs on its own and there was no human intervention at all. And maybe we can listen to the piece just for one minute or two. And, and the piece is quite, quite good. I, I love it. And, you know, so now the situation is the computer created a song and now the real people, human, actually performs the song generated by the computer. It may sound weird, but anyway, the music is really great, but the title is quite geeky, Hello World. 
you know, so, you, you know what, what that means, you know, if, if you have experienced a little bit of programming, you know what that means. Uh, but <coughs> this work was quite epic in the sense that it passed the Turing test almost perfectly. Many music critics and composers didn't notice that this is from a computer. So what that means is the computer created its own style. So that is actually one big achievement. And that is something, in a sense, frightening. And some people, you know, I, I don't agree, but some people go a little bit farther and say that this is an example of the computer ruling the world and people kind of, you know, you know taking the order from the computer and so on and so forth. So it yeah, sounds very you know, weird, but in a sense, we're doing this every day, actually. I mean, if you drive using your navigation, you just follow what the computer says, right? So what, what is the difference? I mean, we're doing this every day. So anyway, you know, that, that was not the point. Let's go back to the question of intelligence. And I mean, you know, I, I'm almost done. It, it will be finished in two or three minutes, I guess. So don't, don't worry. I mean, you know, usually it is not a good sign when the presenter or, you know, the professor brings some kind of definition thing. <laughs> But, but trust me, I'll, I'll, I'll be done in two minutes. So, Again, the question is about intelligence. What is intelligence? And how do we define intelligence? And, and this is actually very nice, you know, from a very nice discourse from David Cope's book. And he says that if you look up the word intelligence in Webster's College Aid Dictionary, published in 1991, it says capacity for learning, reasoning, and understanding. So he tried to find the word reasoning, and he says the power of intelligent and dispassionate thought. So it's kind of like iteration. So you find this word, and you go to this word, and you go back to this word, and so on and so forth. So the next stay, stop would be creativity. From the same dictionary, <laughs> resulting from originality of thought, imaginative. So if you want to imagine, from the imaginative, if you want to find more information about imagination. It says creative talent or ability. So, so what? Uh, I don't know. But anyway, intelligence and creativity, these are the things that are mostly associated with human or you know, people, the real people, not computer. But it is about to change, I think. And speaking of the art, you know, Webster's College Dictionary says the art as the quality, production, expression, or you know, so on and so forth. But another Webster's Dictionary says art is human creativity. So, I mean, there are many different definitions of art, but depending on which viewpoint you, viewpoint you take, we may have very different approach. And my point is this, there is no perfect and you know, right answer to this question. And the, the point I want to make here is, you know, so far we have seen that technology has helped a lot in terms of making new music or evolving, I mean, to, for the music to evolve and progress, right? And now I think it's entering into a quite different phase. So far, it has been considered as a tool for us, tool for us to make music easier, better, and you know, in some interesting fashion that we haven't done. But now the game is quite you know, drastically changing. Now the computer is about to enter the area which previously was considered as human only, right? So it is a very interesting turning point, I think. And we don't really know how this research of AI, you know, how far this research of AI would go and into which direction. But 
from now on, there will be many interesting things, I think. And again, I'm not really sure if this has been the answer to any of the questions you had or this goes well with the topic you have imagined. So, I mean, this is very, I know this is bad. I, I've finished my talk and now I'm asking whether this was something you wanted or not. So, sorry about that. But anyway, you know, it is a little bit early for me, I think, to, I mean, it is a little bit early to make any conclusion on this topic. So, it will continue to evolve and we'll see many interesting and crazy things coming up. So, maybe I think I can stop here and if you want, we may have some time for questions and answers or some coffee or some oxygen break. You know, it, it, anyway, so the, yeah, I, I took this picture from there, NYU. <laughs> yeah. Just nice, by the way. So, I mean, very, very cheesy. You know, conclusion maybe. There, there might be some way that humans and machines can co, co more, more than coexist. I mean, there could be some way that computers or machines can contribute to human area in terms of art and creation or intelligence. And there's a lot of things for us to do and to find out. But I, I think the, the basic point is it, it's not about technology, it's about you know, philosophy and, you know, the, our you know, understanding of humanities, I think. Yep, I think that's it for now. Thank you.